Oh, man. Wow. Woo! That's, like, so encouraging. I'm about to cry. That's incredible. <laughs> that really feels good. That's amazing. It's amazing how that works. Thank you, guys. I love you guys so much. I love being with you as a spiritual family and being in Jack's together. Man, thank you for that. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's party spiritually. All right. Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, it really is great to be together. It's great to continue our identity series. And we've been having some fun, right? Do you remember what we talked about last week? We talked about beauty and identity. And uh, that was really a great time, and I think we did uh, have a good conversation about that. And what we're going to do today is we're going to recap a little bit of that, because I found there is a TED Talk uh, that Cameron Russell gave. This is, um, I forgot, I'm the one that's actually clicking today. So uh, this is Cameron Russell. She's a model. She's been all over magazines, the major magazines, and uh, she's a very, very popular model, but she did this TED Talk, and it was interesting because she started to get vulnerable about what models actually feel. And she said this quote, the thing that we never say on camera, that I have never said on camera, is I am insecure. And I am insecure because I have to think about what I look like every day. And if you are ever wondering, you know, if I have thinner thighs and shinier hair, will I be happier? You just need to meet a group of models because they have the thinnest thighs, the shiniest hair, and the coolest clothes, and they're the most physically insecure women probably on the planet. And so it's really powerful to hear that from her. And then I also found this article uh, that France, because there's about 600,000 young women that struggle with anorexia because of the fascination with the incredible gaunt thinness, and so they've actually now passed a law that requires a label if you digitally altered the photos. So the, it, at the, on each photo, it has to say it's been retouched, and if it doesn't, they can receive up to a $44,000 fine. So the, con the, the, the public consciousness about this issue is really getting heightened. And look, I, I believe there's a flip side of that, which is, hey, this is our body. I think God wants us to take good, as good care of it as we, we can. So I'm not saying it's wrong to be fit. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there is a definitive problem when we pull identity into our beauty. Uh, sorry, beauty into our identity. And today we're going to actually talk about identity and social media. All right, identity and social media. And I'm looking at an awesome social media person right there. So this is going to be fun. Imagine you are at a concert, your favorite artist, and you're there, and the music is bumping, and it's just great. You're feeling it, good vibes. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And you're caught up in the music, and you're there with your friend, and you look to your right, and there's your friend, and your friend is slowly panning around with their phone, and you're asking your friend, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because they're not, they're not into the music at all. And they say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm adding to my Snapchat story. You're like, oh, okay. You know, it, it's interesting how sometimes we can be at events and yet not be at events. You know what I'm saying? And we, we, we take, we take, salute, we take stock of life and sometimes we're just virtually capturing it, not actually capturing it. Maybe we do a, a, a color run or some kind of a race and we're taking selfies of ourselves. Maybe we're going on vacation and we set up the camera to do a nice wistful shot of us looking over the landscape. <laughs> or maybe we have a new boyfriend or girlfriend and we want to take a nice little clever photo of us in our, our new relationship and kind of capture that for the world to see. 
I think you would agree with me when I say that social media has exploded. In fact, according to Statista, there are 2.46 billion, with a B, social media users in 2017. There's about 7 point, what, 6 billion people in the world. So that's about a third of the world is on social media. Look at this Facebook users worldwide, monthly active Facebook users worldwide as of 2017. I know you can't read this, so I'm going to read it for you. This is 2008. 100 million. This is 2017. 2.8. 2 billion Facebook users. That's staggering. There's an explosion. You know, there's an undeniable urgency that we can have to post things, right? Sometimes we just, we, we feel like we just need to broadcast it to the world. Why? Why do we feel this? Well, I think it's because social media has power. Social media gives us an opportunity to give the world a window into our life as we choose to share it. That's part of the key. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Now, I want to kind of, let's, let's get involved a little bit. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't selected anybody from the audience, so this is up to you guys to um, help me out here. But l- let me ask you a question. Would Jesus have posted? Do you think that Jesus would have posted on social media? There's no right or wrong answer here, so don't, don't, don't feel scared. Don't feel scared. Okay, here we go. Do you think that Jesus would have posted? He would know about posting, yes, but that was thousands of years before. You have a good point right there, okay? Yes, okay, all right, in the back. This is the farthest I've ever come in the audience. I'm so sorry if you're watching. You're not even going to be able to get me on this. I definitely think he would post because social media has such a large impact on people and on society as a whole. Great point. Great point. Thank you. Okay. Up here. Now, I am going to tell you guys that we bought a new mic that's a foam cube that we're going to be able to throw around the room in the future. So that's going to be awesome. I think one of the things that I've been realizing about like social media and online presence is at the end of the day, God uses everything for his purpose and for his glory. So at the end of the day, although social media does have the backlash and all the craziness that's been going on with it, I think God would have taken it and used it for his good and for his purposes and made something beautiful out of it. Nice. You guys are so good. Okay, Bright, last one. I actually think that he probably wouldn't have posted because he actually didn't post anything back then. He didn't write anything down himself, you know, and he also told his disciples or he'd tell people not to say anything. But I do think the disciples and everybody else would have posted like crazy. Like, like everybody else, the whole world would have blown up because everybody would have been posting, but Jesus would be like, don't post. Whatever you do, don't post this miracle, you know. Don't that, post. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's great. You know, it's a good question to ask. Um, it's interesting. The co-founder of Instagram said his, their kind of little tagline for Instagram is, we're here to capture and share the world's moments. So in a way, you would think that Jesus would use social media to his advantage because wouldn't he want to get the message out? I mean, wouldn't he want to, to capture and share the one of the greatest moments in the world history, which is him being on earth and what he had to say, you would think so, but Jesus is a little bit of a mystery in this. Now, I know that, like Ben said, that there was no social media back then, but there were other ways to spread his message, right? And yet, when you look at some of the opportunities that Jesus had, he didn't take them. And why? Why didn't he take them? Let's look over in John 7. It says, but when the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near. So here's this big feast where people are coming and streaming in. Jesus' brothers and Jesus' Jesus's brothers said to him, and yes, Jesus did have brothers. Some people think that Jesus didn't have any siblings. He did. Jesus' brothers said to him, 
you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure, you see where they're going with this, right? You see where they're going? They're like, look, hey, let people see. Because if you want to be a public figure, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world for even his own brothers did not believe in him. He's like, hey, if you want to be a public figure, his brother said to him, show yourself to the world. Instagram it. Okay, so what do you think Jesus did? Well, this next line is interesting. Therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come for you. Any time is right. It's hard for me not to read that in a salty way. The time for me has not yet come for you. Any time is right. I mean, I, it's just, I don't know how this, this could not be salty. But anyways, I know Jesus didn't sin, so it must have been a good salty. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jesus is saying, look, the right time for me has not yet come. That means Jesus was thinking and intentional about what he was doing. The world cannot hate you, he went on to say, but it hates me because I testify what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. So he actually stayed there for a while and did not go, did not do what you would think that he would have done. But it goes on. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, yet not publicly, but in secret. Now I'm confused. Now at the feast, the Jews are watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. So he did, end up, he did go to the feast, but he went in secret. And Jesus was very intentional about what he did. He was very intentional and he was very controlled. And don't you get this sense that he was very confident about what, who he was and what he was going to do? But why was this? I, I honestly believe with all my heart that the reason why Jesus was so bold and so confident was because he was so secure in his relationship with his father. And it says this in John 5.30, I don't try to please myself but I try to please the one who sent me. See, he was listening to God's voice. He said, it's not the right time. Why? Because he knew, he was so connected to God, he knew it wasn't the right time. He was confident. He wasn't thrown off by the people around him. And you know, this is a tough concept for us, isn't it? Because we're surrounded by people at school. We're surrounded by people at work. We're surrounded by people in our family, and a lot of times people have opinions of us. Have you ever felt the weight of the opinions of people around you? Have you ever felt the judgment of people around you? And you get that kind of anxious spirit. You get that tenseness. You're wondering what people are going to think about you, what they're going to say about you. I mean, even at that feast, remember, some people said, oh, he's a good man, and some people said, oh, he deceives the people. The crowd is fickle, isn't it? What does all this have to do with social media? Let me start off by saying this. Social media is a neutral tool. This by no means is going to be any sort of a rant on social media. I believe that it's just a tool. Any tool can be used for good or for evil. It's just a tool. It's a platform. It's nothing more than that. But the problem is not with social media. The problem is with us. Because social media can play into our dark side sometimes, can it? And for some of us, we wrestle, and this is such a bad word, but we wrestle with being people pleasers, don't we? We wrestle with listening to the voice of those around us. And you know, there are two huge fears that people pleasers have. Do you know what they are? 
The fear of rejection, the fear of rejection and not being accepted, and number two, the fear of failure. You know, when we have in our hearts, in our minds, the things of the people around us, these fears often crop up. You might feel it when you present a project at work. You might feel it when you're wondering if you're going to graduate on time or not. And you're going to graduate, oh, you think, you know what, it's going to take me five years now, not four. Six years now, not five. Seven years now. I'm just going to stop at seven. But, and, you, and you might think, what are people going to think of me? Are they going to think I'm dumb? Are they going to think that, that I, I, I'm not good enough? I'm not, there's so many things that we feel rejected by people. We can feel the judgment. And this one blogger, Angie Riggs, said, When people-pleasing replaces God-pleasing, fear of failure or rejection is at the root. People are driven by the need for approval and desire to become successful, not only to avoid being rejected, but for self-approval. Does that resonate at all with you? You know, you know it's not about social media because this fear, these fears of rejection or fear of failure, this happened way back when. In fact, look at this passage in the scriptures. It says, Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him, in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. See, what we're talking about, guys, right now is our usage of social media, how are we using it? Why are we using it? And the problem with social media for many of us is that it has exploded so much that we're not being as intentional potentially as we should be with, with this motivation. And we can make social media into a people-pleasing prison. There was an English social theorist, late 18th century, Jeremy Bentham, and he worked on this concept of this prison for 16 years. It was a prison like no other prison. This is what it was like. The idea was straightforward. You build a circular prison with a tower in the center so the guards can see inside any and every cell from a single location. The watchtower could even be obscured in some way so that prisoners would have no idea who the guards were looking at. Since prisoners would know they might be watched, might being the key word, might be watched at any given moment, they'd act as though they were being watched at all moments. This is the only existing prison that was ever built to resemble what Jeremy Bentham was thinking. This is in Cuba. It's now abandoned. But you could see the guardhouse being in the, in the top. You could be obscured, so you can't see. But all of the prison cells would be glass. And so you never know whether that guard is looking at you or not. And because of that, it affects your psychology. It affects the way you think because you think, wait, I better not try something because I may be being watched right now, but you don't know. Then there is this French philosopher, Michel Fousseau, who actually went on with this theory and talked about the psychological impact. And he said, that, that, by the way, it was called the panopticon. That's the, the, the circular prison. The panoptic schema makes any apparatus of power more intense. Its strength is that it never intervenes. It is exercised spontaneously and without noise. Prisoners collaborate in their own surveillance because their heads are haunted by the thought of an all-seeing eye. Sounds actually pretty scary, that, that whole thing. An all-seeing eye. Let me ask you guys a question. Can you see any parallel between the panopticon and social media? Any parallel between an all-seeing eye and our lives and us being in front of the world? 
We have to think about this for a second. Because this, these prisoners, they were haunted by the thought of an all-seeing eye. Do we feel the judgment of the world because we feel so connected to the world that it's speaking to our lives? You know, I was talking to somebody who said, they see posts like this. Recently, they got off of Instagram because they were seeing posts like this, and it was of her friends. But she wasn't invited to the party. And so when she saw this, and she's like one of the only ones left out, she felt rejected. And that, that rejection hurt deep inside. And she said, actually, the more that she would scroll a lot of times, the more that these feelings would happen. I, I, I also have this thing that I would like to call compare and despair, which is you look at a feed and you look at things and you're comparing your life to the people around you. So you might see someone going on vacation, you see the, all these awesome shots, or you see their family and you see all these awesome shots. And again, I'm not trying to make this social media rant, but I think it's important for us to just get honest for a second and, and expose the thoughts that come in our mind. We see someone's body. Have you, ever, have you ever looked and just, you can't stop looking, you go like, man, why is this person so in shape and I'm so out of shape? Or why does this person have such a great vacation and, and my vacation stinks? Because, like, all, my family's fighting the whole vacation. And yet, you know what's interesting about social media, guys? You don't usually post the mundane. You don't usually post the argument on the way to the airport. <laughs> That's not usually the thing that you're posting, like, just got in a great fight with my family. I mean, you're... You're not posting that stuff, are you? You're, but what you are posting is the shot overlooking the water. And, and that's part of the problem, is that we see a curated look. And like I said, you can show whoever you want to the all-seeing eye of the people out there, of who you want to present yourself to be. But the problem is, are we listening to the voice of the people and trying to present who we think people want us to be? Or are we listening to God's voice and being who we are in trying to listen to the voice of the Father? You know, I, I want to kind of just get honest with myself for a second about my, I feel like I've wrestled a lot with social media because I love it. I think it's a great tool. Uh, I use it. Uh, our church uses it. Uh, I think that there's so many amazing benefits. You can connect with people from all over the world. I, I, I asked a few of you guys and uh, earlier, and you said one of the greatest benefits is you might see a friend that you haven't seen in a long time, and something pops up in, in the feed, and you say, oh, man. I, I, you know, suddenly they're on your heart again, and that's a great thing. And so I see those things, and that's great. I, I also love when you're able to share your life and things that you're, you're doing or thoughts that you have, and I think that, that can be great too. But, you know, I was, I was talking to uh, Danny, which, uh, who, who's on staff here, and if you're watching, and we were talking, I said a lot of times I don't post stuff because I don't want it to be taken in the wrong way. Like, I, I feel like I'm hypersensitive to what people could interpret my post being. So if I post a good post, and I'm thinking, oh, maybe people are thinking it's, it's like a, a little brag about something. Like, let's say I run a race, and I'm really happy with the result, and I want to post that. And I'm like, oh, are people going to think, like, I'm trying to intentionally say that I did really good in this, and they're going to compare it to themselves and X, Y, Z. And I, I have all these mental circles I go around. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like this before. But she said, you know, but maybe that's an insecurity in you. Because... Maybe you're so concerned with how other people are going to interpret something that maybe that shows that you have some people pleasing in you. That was a good point. <laughs> Stung a little bit, but it was good. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I am listening sometimes to the voices of people. 
Because I do experience a lot of judgment, actually. Um, in trying to innovate sometimes or trying to move the ball forward and trying to, trying to move the church forward, I take a lot of criticisms from a lot of sides. And that's why, honestly, you guys, when you guys stood up and cheered, it really meant a lot to me. It really did. Um, I, I have to be honest. And so getting, putting yourself out there, I know how it feels for you because it's how it feels for me. It feels scary to be judged sometimes, and it's hard. But I think the key is we've got to listen to God's voice, and his voice has got to be the strongest out of anybody's. Jesus was despised more than any of us, and yet he was totally secure. How is that? I think it's because he listened to God's voice. If, if you think about it, there's so much noise out there. And if we're not careful, if we don't carve out time to listen to God's voice, that's when we just get swept away by the wind and the waves of the world. I, I remember the story of, of Elijah after he had a huge victory, a huge victory against all these false prophets. And then he was told that, he, that Jezebel wanted to kill him because of the victory he had. And you remember what he did? If, if, you, if you know the, the story, he ran. He was scared after this huge victory. And, and in fact, he wanted to die. He had this super low moment. And then after wanting to die and just being laid out in the desert, God took care of him and sent, sent him ravens and food. And he said, I want you to go up to this mountain. And Elijah went up to the mountain and God said, I want you to wait here because I'm going to pass by. And he was up in this mountain, and this huge, powerful wind came and tore the rocks off the other side of the mountain. But God wasn't there. And then there was this earthquake that happened, and God wasn't there. And there was this fire that happened, and God wasn't there. And then there was this gentle whisper. And Elijah walked out to the mouth of the cave, and God spoke to him in a whisper. Sometimes we're not going to hear God in a huge noisiness. It's going to be the tiny whisper. That's why Jesus sometimes broke away from the crowd and spent time alone with the Father. He knew he needed that. What are some practicals? How can we use social media in a healthy way? I think a good practice might be to do a heart check. Just on our motives. Why we post. I mean, we're not going to be perfect in all we do. So I'm not saying that we can always know our motives perfectly. But at the end of the day, I think that we should post out of, at least at, post out of purity. <laughs> Posting out of purity. And ask ourselves, God, are you pleased with this post? Because with all the negativity happening in this world, man, oh man, I don't think we have to add to it. I think that we can add our voice into a discussion. But would Jesus want us to post what we're going to post? Because sometimes we can post the same exact thing in a different way. Personally, my dream is that as a Jack's church, we can help bring Jacksonville together. And I want to I see... Races and ethnicities brought together. Genders. Ages. I, mean, I think that we, have, we can be a shining light in those things. But as we join a national conversation and everything, let's, let's make sure that we're listening to God's voice in that as well. And secondly, be free. Because when you look at the disciples and how free they were, it's amazing. It says in Acts 4.12, now, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You know, these, the people around Peter and John, they were uneducated, untrained. They could have felt insecure about those, those things, but they, they weren't. The disciples weren't. They were confident. And they had this boldness and confidence because they had been with Jesus. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, Hey, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If, people, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. 
Look, at the end of the day, guys, we have to listen to God's voice because I asked Siri the meaning of life and it wasn't a great response. I recorded it for you, okay? This is what Siri told me. I said, Siri, what's the meaning of life? I would ask that you address your spiritual questions to someone more qualified to comment, ideally a human. See what I mean? Siri is not going to save you. Another practical, read more than the feed. Look, read your Bible. Get God's word infused in your heart and your mind. Get that confidence, that spiritual confidence of who you are. If you're putting Facebook and the likes, if you're seeking approval, and if you're trolling for 48 hours, and you're going, oh, I didn't only got 12 likes, nobody likes me, you're, you're barking up the wrong alley, okay? Don't live for the likes. Live for God. Amen. Let's go ahead and let's pray for the communion. Father, thank you so much for your awesomeness and your power and your glory and your majesty. Father, I pray we can live for you. I pray we can live for an audience of one. That we know that at the end of the day, when everything's stripped away, when we die, you're the audience that we want to live for. So let's do it now, Father. I pray that you give us strength and wisdom and encouragement and support from our spiritual community. And we can stand up and rally each other and, and encourage each other like I felt in the beginning, Father. We can do that for each other throughout the week, for the, for the year, for the rest of our life, Father. And we can feel the encouragement from you, especially more than anyone. Father, I pray that we carve out the time. I pray you would bless each and every person here in this room, watching online, that, that we would listen to your whispers. And we would feel that encouragement and saying, I love you. I accept you. You're my amazing child. And that out of that grace, there could be so much obedience. Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus' example that he did that. That he was so secure and confident because he was pleasing you. Even when the crowd was so fickle, the Roman mob was so fickle, he wasn't sad. He was sad for them. <laughs> but he was inside. He was content. And he prayed for them. Father, help us to have that kind of a heart. We love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.